Okay, hello everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Tonight we're continuing in our study of the book of Job, and tonight we begin chapter 37. Uh, if you have not seen the previous episodes, uh, I hope you will go back and watch them. Uh, they're uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Um, this book is very important that you have context, uh, and you must uh, start from the beginning because chapters 1 and 2 give you the context and foundation to understand the rest of it. Okay, so everything beyond that, you have to always keep in mind what happened in chapter one and chapter two. Uh, I'm not going to rehash that tonight, but uh, before we get started, let me ask Brother Stephen to introduce himself. Hey, everybody, Brother Stephen here, you know, also known as Stephen Rivers TV on YouTube. Again, looking forward to another night of just studying course fellowship and, you know, looking at the book of Job. And, of course, my favorite part, in about 50 minutes, spreading the gospel. All right. Thank you, Brother Stephen. Uh, I am what uh, Brother Joe Byron uh, coined the term uh, uh, KJV firstist. For like 25 years, I was a KJV onlyist. But now I, uh, my position is I always want to look at the KJV first. But I don't rule out looking at other translations or commentaries uh, or asking Brother Stephen or anybody else, any, anybody who can help me, even, including other translations. If it can help me to better understand the scriptures, then I want to consider it. So we will read the KJV first. Then I'll look at it also in the Amplified because the Amplified, more than a translation, is, uh, is like a more of a... Um, uh, commentary, I think. It amplifies the verses. Um, all right, I'm going to read it completely through the whole chapter, uh, chapter 37 in the KJV one time. It doesn't, it's not really that long. It's only 24 verses. <clears throat> so let me read it completely so we get the whole context. It says, At this also my heart trembleth, and is moved out of his place. Hear attentively the noise of his voice and the sound that goeth out of his mouth. He directeth it unto the whole heaven and his lightning unto the ends of the earth. After it, a voice roareth. He thundereth with the voice of his excellency, and he will not stay them when his voice is heard. God thundereth marvelously with his voice. Great things doeth he which we cannot comprehend. For he saith to the snow, Be thou on the earth, likewise to the small rain and to the great rain of his strength. He sealeth up the hand of every man, that all men may know his work. Then the beasts go into dens and remain in their places. Out of the south cometh the whirlwind, and cold out of the north. By the breath of God frost is given, and the breadth of the waters is straightened. Also, by watering, he wearieth the thick cloud. He scattereth his bright cloud, and it is turned round about by his counsels, that they may do whatsoever he commandeth them upon the face of the whole in the earth. No, upon the face of the world in the earth. He causeth it to come whether for correction or for his land or for his mercy. Hearken unto this, O Job. Stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. Dost thou not, does thou, thou know when God disposed them and caused the light of his cloud to shine? Dost thou know the balancing of the clouds, the wondrous works of him which is perfect in knowledge? How thy garments are warm when he quieteth the earth by the south wind? Hast thou with him spread out the sky, which is strong and as a molten looking glass? Teach us what we shall say unto him, for we cannot order our speech by reason of darkness. Shall it be told him that I speak? If a man speak, surely he shall be swallowed up. And now men see not the bright light which is in the clouds, 
but the wind passeth and cleanseth them. Fair weather cometh out of the north, with God is terrible majesty. Touching the Almighty, we cannot find him out. He is excellent in power and in judgment, and in plenty of justice he will not afflict. Men do therefore fear him. He respecteth not any that are wise of heart. All right. Um, we've been uh, kind of playing a game uh, these last few chapters. Uh, after I read the whole chapter in the KJV, I want to give you an opportunity to t give a title to the chapter if, if, that, that would explain the essence of what the chapter is about. And then we'll look at the Amplified uh, because the Amplified actually uh, they've included a title. And we'll see if your title agrees with the Amplified. So do you have a title in mind? All right, I'll take a shot. Looking at this, I would say it looks like he's describing like the power and the works of God in this chapter. So I would say Elihu is pretty much talking about, you know, God's works and power in this chapter. So that's what, that's what I would say the title is probably around that. Okay, uh, this title the Amplified has selected is Elihu says God has authority over the storm. So uh, I would say that we, we have to be careful when we read a chapter like this. Uh, there's actually quite a few chapters and, and verses in, uh, in the Job that um, the Calvinists would love to use to, for their purposes of giving us the impression that God uh, determines everything. And I've talked about this in previous chapters, but now because this chapter is, is, is another potential problem uh, that Calvinists could misuse it, I need to address this again. Um, first of all, in the KJV translation, the word sovereign does not appear even one time. And yet the, the, uh, uh, the Calvinists, they think the word sovereign is the most important word in the Bible and yet it's not there. Because Calvinism is all based upon what the Calvinist says is the sovereignty of God. And they, they don't even understand what that word means, apparently. Because God certainly is sovereign, even though the word's not in the KJV. We, the concept of sovereignty uh, is, is uh, certainly there. Uh, but God is sovereign the same way king is sovereign. A king has the power to make any decision, do anything he wants in his kingdom, but he's not exercising control over every person in the kingdom at all times. But any time he decides that he wants to exercise his power, he's sovereign. He has the right to do it and the ability to do it. So God is omnipotent in that he can do what he wants, but, but in his sovereignty, he has decided that he's not going to control everything, but he gives men free will so the man can make his own decisions. Now, let me ask you if you can tell me what you think is the basic reason God does not want to control all of our thoughts, words, and deeds and gives us free will so we can decide for ourselves what we think and, and, and do. Well, do you have an idea about that? Well, I mean, that's a tough question. But um, like when I'm thinking about why God would give us, you know, free will, like to me, it would just seem bad to like, you know, God's character. If it was just in his, if he just decided, I just want to cast, you know, 99% of people into hell and only allow, you know, 1% to actually, you know, believe on the son, you know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. You know, I couldn't see, you know, well, obviously, you know, that's not even God's will is for us to even, is for us to perish. So, I mean, it wouldn't make any sense for him to, to force people, you know, to fall into hell and to force people away from him. So I feel like it's just a contradiction of, you know, some things that, you know, he's already said and the things he's promised, you know, which he won't take back. So, 
I can't fully answer that question, but this is, you know, what I'm thinking of right now. All right. Well, that's a pretty good beginning to the answer, but we could take five hours to answer that one question. In fact, I have a playlist called Calvinism Debunked, and I think it's about, you know, eight or ten hours long, where we do address all of the um, uh, teachings of Calvinism and, and show that how they're all erroneous and not biblical. But I think what you said is a good beginning to, to in that uh, if God was... Uh, did what Calvinists say that he does. And that is that he controls every thought I have. I don't have any, my mind doesn't work freely. God's controlling all my thoughts. Uh, every word that comes out of my mouth, God made me speak it. He's controlling me like a puppet master or a, a robot. And, and every word that comes out, every physical action that I do, God is making me do it. And that would make me mo uh, no different than, um, let's say, a gun. Now, there's a saying that guns don't kill people. People kill people. A gun is an inanimate object. It's not capable of thinking and acting on its own. It's just a tool. It's a weapon. Uh, now, someone can pick up the gun and use it and shoot, kill someone if they wanted to. But the gun's not the guilty party. It's just a tool. It's inanimate. And in that way, in Calvinism, man is just like a tool that God's using. Man is not making any decisions. God is just using man to go around and rape and murder and pillage and lie and cheat and steal. Everything that man does, God's using man to do it. So therefore, it makes God um, really more evil than even the, 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 the worst understanding of Satan. Uh, as evil as we understand Satan to be, in Calvinism, S Satan actually is an innocent party. Just like man is completely an innocent party in Calvinism. Uh, how can you hold Satan responsible for all the bad things he's done when God is controlling him and making him do everything? Same thing with us. If, if, if God really acted the way the Calvinists say he does, then I could die, go to heaven, be judged, and I had to have the right to say, God, I'm innocent. I didn't do anything wrong. You're the one that controlled me. You're the guilty party. I'm completely innocent. And so, uh, see, that's it, it makes God into the, the only one that's truly a sinner in Calvinism is God. Uh, so that's the problem with it. But also, and that's because, so God doesn't want to control us like that, and and he doesn't. He gives us free will. That way man is responsible for his own decisions, his own actions. And also, only with free will can God have a actual reciprocal loving relationship. God loves us. He chooses to. And we, we can choose to love him or we can choose to reject him. But if we were forced to love him, you know, there's a there's a, a criminal act that when you force someone to love you, it's called rape, you know. God is not, can't force us to love him. It's not truly love, is it? Uh, so we, he has to give us free will so that we have the right to choose to love him and embrace him or reject him, shun him. Uh, before I go any further, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, I agree to that statement. Because overall, I mean, I think you summed it up pretty well. We really would, there would be no need for our gospel or, you know, any of that if that was truly the case. Because if God's just in control, then that means, you know, it's only basically if he likes you, basically, that you're going to go to heaven. Or if he just felt like, okay, I'll let this one go. Like, there would be no need for us to even believe on Jesus. Because in the end, we don't have any free will where we're going anyway. So, I mean, just as a whole. And, of course, also with those actions as well it would kind of say that God's the only evil one. You know, if that's the case. So I think it was put out pretty well. Uh, and also you mentioned that uh, the verse that uh, God does not desire that any of us should perish, but that we should all should come to repentance. And I, I believe the repentance in that verse is, is in the context of changing our mind about believing in Jesus. So uh, I could rephrase it and paraphrase it and say, 
God doesn't desire that any of us should perish in, in hell. And instead, he, he desires that we all change our mind and embrace Jesus for salvation. That's what his desire is. So if God desires that, then that doesn't that mean that if he's uh, actually going to control everything we do, he'd, he'd actually make everybody believe. Why would he make anybody not believe and, and just so he can put them in hell? Uh, so it really leads me to uh, conclude that if God was doing that, we would have to say that universalism would be true, that God, God, why would he choose to make a small percentage of the people believe and most of the people never allow them to believe and get saved? Uh, it seems to me, it's only logical if God does desire that none of us should perish, then he would make all of us believers by force. Uh, so it would lead to universalism. Uh, but I, listen, it's not supposed to be a study on Calvinism, but if you're a viewer and you are uh, not that familiar with Calvinism, I urge you to go watch my videos, Calvinism Debunked, and we've just only scratched the surface in these few minute, minutes. So please watch that. But now let's go through this chapter here slowly. In the Amplified, it says, and this is Elihu uh, speaking here. It, uh, we didn't really know that it, when we started reading chapter 37 in the KJV. Uh, I, I, I assumed it once I got down into it. But right now, the, the title is Elihu says God has authority over the storm. So this is Elihu speaking. He says, indeed, at his thundering, my heart trembles and leaps out of its place. Listen carefully to the thunder of his voice and the rumbling that goes out of his mouth. He lets it loose under the whole heaven and his lightning to the ends of the earth. Uh, well, let's stop there here. And look, that's, that's verse three, but concentrate on verse one. It says, indeed, at his thundering, my heart trembles and leaps out of its place. I found that verse to be very interesting. Yeah, because, you know, just at the sound of, you know, like, you know, the thunderclap of God, you know, it just kind of shows, like, the reaction to, like, God. Like, I guess to saying, you know, like, how small we are, you know, in comparison to him. You know, because, like, you know, jumping out of place, it can be, sounds like a reaction of fear, you know, at first, you know, at first listen. And, but yet it could also, I guess, also when I think of, you know, leaping, I also think of about joy. You know, as I feel like would be a re a reaction by a lot of people, you know, when, you know, God makes his appearance. Well, I mean, obviously, you know, anywhere he could show up at any time, like it would be a major reaction. But of course, when we look at this and it's talking about um, like the thunder about it, you know, going under the whole heaven and the whole into the earth, it just talks about like his magnitude pretty much of like his power, you know, and his authority in this situation. Well, as I was reading it, it made me recall our conversation before we started the live show where you told me, I asked you, uh, I didn't see you yesterday. I said, how, how'd you, how was, did you do yesterday? How was it? And, and you said, well, I had a great time. I, I, I spent about an hour in prayer under the stars. And you enjoyed being out in creation, looking up the stars, looking at creation and praying. And... Uh, it to me that that kind of relates to this. I think Elihu is is making us understand that wait, as as the scripture says, all of creation testifies of God. And uh, to me, that's well, I, to me most of the time when I get on creation, it's on a golf course. Uh, golf courses are beautiful, and you know, and I'm golfing, and I and, you know, I throughout my golf round, I, I end up praying a lot and thanking God and, and, and just uh, amazed by how beautiful his creation is. And I think this is kind of the beginning of what Elihu is saying here. Before I go on, any comment on that? Mm. Yeah, I like that. Um, especially with that type of a reaction, that would be similar to, I guess, you know, what I was kind of experiencing yesterday when I was just looking out at like the magnitude of like the stars, you know, thinking about the universe and of course, remi being reminded that, you know, nothing, no creation is ever bigger or better than the creator. So just looking at the size of that and just kind of just taking in, you know, God's magnitude 
And of course, then if he were to suddenly appear in front of me, I mean, I would have gone nuts. I know that. So that is a good connection. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of times things like that happen and you, we say, well, that's, that's really coincidental, isn't it? It's amazing how many coincidences we have in our um, in our walk as Christians. Uh, you know, you're you're out in creation and looking at the stars, being blown away by the, the magnitude of God's creation and you're in prayer and fellowship with God. And yet and then we come tonight and that's basically what this chapter is just telling us. All right, let me read on. It says in verse 4, um, After it, his voice roars. He thunders with the voice of his majesty, and he does not restrain his lightning against his adversaries when his voice is heard. God thunders marvelously with his voice. He does great things which we cannot comprehend. For he says to the snow, Fall on the earth, and he speaks to the showers and to the downpour of his mighty rains. Be strong. I'll stop there after verse 6, but I think you can see now we're getting into the verses that made me go off onto that anti-Calvinism speech because these verses here could be used by Calvinists to try to see God is controlling everything at all times. Yeah, I can see why you would have drawn that. But these verses definitely do talk about, like, you know, here emphasizing the authority he has, like, over, you know, like the storms, or just in general, just like in his majesty. But I could see where a Calvinist, you know, could take this and spin it. Well, I mean, there's several verses that he could, I mean, sorry, that they could spin. But, yeah, because especially if they look at just, you know, like sovereignty on its own then they might relate that to their doctrine. Yeah. Now, um, these examples that we're reading here, um, how it says that, uh, it says, for he says to the snow, fall on the earth. And he speaks to the showers and to the downpour of his mighty rain, be strong. So in these verses, we're seeing that God says, to the snow, fall on the earth, and to the rain, rain really strong, big downpour. Now, the point, though, is that there's a difference between God doing that and God doing it all the time. Uh, God established creation so that it would work a certain way. Uh, you know, we have uh, the what's that called, the water cycle, or where, uh, you know, you have water, it evaporates, it, and then it forms into uh, clouds, and then it, it falls down. It's, I forgot what the scientific term for the cycle of the water. But, but all of creation, God has established these systems, the gravity, the, the uh, tetonic plates, all these things that he, the way he's designed things, and then it, it runs. It's like you make a watch and you wind it up and it runs. But that doesn't mean that he, uh, he does not uh, sometimes say, okay, it's, it's naturally raining over there, but I'm going to stop the rain for my purpose today because I, uh, it's, it's going to flood, so I'll stop it. Or they need rain over there, so I'm going to make it rain, and they've been praying and pleading with me, and I'm going to intervene. So God can intervene into his creation Whenever he wants to, that's what omnipotence means. He has the ability to do it if he wants to. But he's also sovereign in that he, he, uh, he can choose to just let things run. Now, that brings us to what's happened in the news the last week. Some of the worst storms and flooding in American history. Great loss of life and, and property this last week. And, and in Texas, these tornadoes going through, these storms and just destroying things. Um, some people would say that God actually made the storms go in there and do, do all that destruction. Now, what, what I believe is that God very well may use a storm sometimes for his purpose to destroy something if he wants to. But we can't assume all the time 
that every time that there's a storm or a flood or something and lost some loss of life, don't assume that God caused it to happen. I would assume God didn't cause it to happen, and it's just part of nature. And uh, But sometimes God prevents it from happening in answer to our prayers. So what's your reaction to that? Oh, yeah. I mean, I definitely believe he can, you know, intervene, you know, whenever he wants to, although most of the time, now, I would figure he chooses, you know, not to. That's just me figuring. Now, I don't know too much about what's going on over the last um, couple weeks, but I wouldn't want to think, especially if it was a bunch of unsafe people, I wouldn't think he would want to just kill people and prevent them, you know, from, you know, getting the gospel. But that's my opinion. Hang on, actually. I have to go for about five minutes, but I'll be right back. All right, then, let me go on. Uh, okay, it says, uh, that was verse uh, 6. So verse 7 in the Amplified says, God seals, that means brings to a standstill, stops, by severe weather, the hand of every man, that all men whom he has made may know his work, that is, his sovereign power and their subjection to it. Okay, now here we have the word sovereign appearing in verse 7 of the, of the um, chapter 37. But this is the amplified translation. And as I said in the beginning of this broadcast, I'm a KJV firstist. So what I, when I, I read the KJV first because... Uh, I'm going to present the KJV as our scriptures. Um, and, and then I will look at other translations sometimes to help, help me understand things. But uh, the KJV is the one that I'm going to rely on if, if push comes to shove. And, and the KJV does not have the word sovereign in, in the entire Bible one time. And yet right here we see the word sovereign in the Amplified Translation. So the Amplified, now there's nothing wrong with the word sovereign, as I said, as long as we understand it correctly. And the, the problem is though, that uh, there is a, a faction of Christendom. I'm, I, I'm not gonna say a faction of Christians, because I'm sorry, I, I believe that uh, there's a lot of Calvinists that I, I challenge whether they're even Christians, because that they don't believe in the same God I do. The God I believe in the Bible is a, a God that has the qualities of love, mercy, justice, forgiveness. Um, and he's, he's not unjust where he's just going to go around making people sin and then sending them to hell for it, you know. Um, so they believe in some demonic type of God. Uh, it, it's even worse than, than Satan. So uh, that's why I think that if a, if a Calvinist, that's their perception of who God is, then I challenge them whether they're even Christians. Um, but uh, the, uh, there, there's really nothing wrong with using the word sovereign as long as we understand that sovereign means God can do whatever he wants, and one thing he wants to do is give us free will. <laughs> so... Um, but getting back to this verse here, it says, um, it says, God seals, brings to a standstill, stops by severe weather, the hand of every man. So it's, it's saying that God will use weather to prevent someone, like if, if, if he didn't want me to go out uh, somewhere tonight, uh, he might cause the weather to be really bad so that I wouldn't go out in it. Um, that's the, kind of the point the verse is, is making. But the um, uh, again, we have to differentiate between God intervening in his creation and, and, and then God actually controlling every molecule that moves and every thought that we have and every action that we do. That's taking... Uh, sovereignty and putting it on steroids and, and perverting it. And then verse 8, it says, 
Then the beast goes into its lair and remains in its hiding place. Um, I think that is just a reaction. Verse 8 is a reaction to verse the previous verses because the beast is not going to go out in that kind of weather. It's going to stay in its, its cave or its lair for protection. So you see, that's an example of how what I just said. I said God could make it uh, the weather really bad, forcing me to stay in my house. And here in the very next verse, it makes the same point, but using a beast, saying, then the beast goes into its lair and remains in its hiding place. All because God made this storm and that caused the beast to go inside. Uh, all right, now verse um, 9. Out of its chamber comes the storm and cold from the north wind. Ice is made by the breath of God and the expanse of the waters is frozen. Um, well, I, again, if I just keep repeating this this point because I'm I'm so uh, guarded against um, anybody coming to any Calvinistic conclusions that because they, you could take the, some of these verses and and then you argue that see God is controlling everything, God is determining everything, and it's important we understand that. God is omnipotent. That means he can do whatever he wants, but he's also free to let things play out in nature. Uh, we have seasons. It gets warmer, and then it cools off, and then it gets cold, and then it gets warmer again, and so on. It's, it's the seasons. It's the, it's the way God has created our world to operate. Uh, and And... But then if God decides he wants to enter into that and cause something kind of aberrant to happen or something specific for a purpose, he's omnipotent. He has the power and he has the sovereignty. He has the ability to decide to do that if he wants to. But let's not take that idea and pervert it and, and teach that God is causing every storm and uh, every time people are dying from storms and tornadoes and tsunamis and, and stuff, that God made it happen. That would, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure God has used this weather sometimes throughout history to destroy some people if he wanted to destroy them. But uh, don't, don't extrapolate that and, and think that God's controlling everything at all times. Uh, and it says, uh, he loads the thick cloud with moisture he disperses the cloud of, of his lightning. Uh, again, this is the cycle. I forgot, if anybody knows this, you might make a comment of the, uh, the cycle of uh, um, it rains, then the water you know, it pools and the water evaporates and it goes up into the clouds and then it rains again. It's a constant cycle. And uh, so he, that's what this verse is pointing out. Right? He loads the thick cloud with moisture he disperses the cloud with his lightning. Its direction is turned around by his guidance that it may do whatever he commands it on the face of the inhabited earth. Uh, yeah, that's all true. Except that he's not controlling every cloud and every storm and every raindrop uh, at all times. Uh, 13, whether it be for correction or for his earth generally, or for his mercy and loving kindness, he causes it to happen. Okay. I, I would prefer if they would translate that he, he can cause it to happen. He can. He has the ability to do it. But he doesn't cause everything to happen. Because sometimes some parts of, of what's going on is just God set in motion. He made a creation. He set laws of, of nature. Uh, you know, we have uh, the various uh, laws that are govern the universe. He established them, and then things, it's like he set things in motion. It's, it's spinning, and it's spinning. But if he wants to intervene, he, he does. And then in verse 14, it says, uh, Listen to this, Job. Uh, stand still and consider the wonders of God. 
Do you know how God establishes and commands them and makes the lightning of his storm cloud shine? Do you know about the layers of thick clouds and how they are balanced and poised in the heavens, the wonderful works of him who is perfect in knowledge? You whose garments are hot when he quiets the earth in sultry summer with the oppressive south wind. Well, let me pause there. Uh, what Elihu is really trying to do here, I think, for several chapters, Elihu has been um, lecturing Job. If you haven't been watching this series from the beginning, uh, you should understand that Uh, first of all, of course, Satan appeared before God and said, there's nobody good in the world that loves you. And God said, well, have you considered my servant Job? Are you, let me see, he's back. I have to approve him. Okay. Um, so, uh, say, and God says, have you considered my Satan, my servant Job? In other words, out of everybody in the entire world, God singled out one person as an example for Satan to examine. Uh, and then the more we study our, about who Job is, what he's done, and his great virtues, uh, we, we see that God made a great choice. He may be the most righteous, best man in the world. Perhaps that's why God chose Job. Uh, and But God allows Satan to go torment Job, take away his family, his property, and his health, uh, all in an attempt to prove that Satan wanted to prove that if all these blessings were taken away from Job, that Job wouldn't love God. He only loves him because he's been so blessed. In fact, Job would even curse God if he didn't have all these blessings. So that's the experiment that's going on. But two things to understand. Job is, and God is not afflicting Job. It's Satan. This is a demonic attack, not a, not a punishment from God. And it's not happening because God, because Job is wicked. It's become, happening because Job is the most righteous man in the world. So that's the thing you have to understand from the beginning as we go through all of Job. And then we have three so-called friends of Job that are supposed to be really wise, and they come one after another and give them these long lectures too, accusing Job that the reason these bad things are happening to you is because you're wicked and God's punishing you. And then Job answers back and defends himself saying no i'm innocent uh it's it's not fair it's uh, i if first of all you didn't understand even believe god was doing it to him and then he finally conceded well if god's doing it to me it's not because i'm wicked i'm innocent so job doesn't understand what happened in chapter one and two and he doesn't know really that it's a demonic attack and uh but he's defending his virtue and so, and now we got this fourth friend, this young guy that comes in and he decides that he's been listening to all these debates back and forth between these three friends and Job uh, discussing and arguing. They're condemning Job and Job's defending himself. And then Elihu decides, look, I thought you guys were older and wiser, but you don't know what you're talking about. So he's taking over and now it's his turn to condemn Job. And he says, not only... Are you wicked and you need to repent because what really is happening here is you're being punished by God because you're wicked. You need to repent and then God will restore you. Uh, and that, But then Elihu adds another accusation says, and in addition to that, you, you've even now guilty of accusing God of being unjust because you say you're totally innocent and yet God's punishing you. So that's the kind of the, the whole thing that's gone on through all these chapters. And now we have Elihu continuing on here, but now he's at the point where he wants to impress Job. He's hoping to humble Job and say, Job, don't you know how great God is? Can't you humble yourself down and repent and submit to God? And you know, maybe then he'll, he'll restore you and bless you again. Look how great God is. Humble yourself. Uh, brother, I okay. I'll, you, if you heard what I said, I'll let you re answer that before I move on. Yeah. Um, well, I wasn't. I am a little bit off, you know, due to me being off for about ten minutes. But to that last statement, I mean, 
everybody who knows the context knows that <coughs> sorry everybody knows that you know job you know is a just man and as it even said you know in the first chapter that he you know feared god so we already know that he was humble you know and respected god but of course you know this is just a lie who just continuing to you know argue his point by you know talking about you know god's sovereignty you know from his point of view at this time well, I don't really have much else to say as of right now. Well, I have to ask you about something you just said. You started off by saying everybody knows that Job was a just man. Everybody who's read it then. Uh, yeah, because obviously these three friends and Elihu don't know it. They're not, they're not agreeing to your, your statement. They're claiming he's wicked and it's a punishment from God and he deserves it. All right, uh, so now I'm on verse uh, uh, I th yeah, I'm on verse 14. It says, "Listen to this, Job, stand still and consider the wonders of God. Do you know how God establishes and commands them and makes the lightning of his storm cloud shine? Do you know about the layers of thick clouds and how they are balanced and poised in the heavens, the wonderful works of him who is perfect in knowledge? You whose garments are hot when he quiets the earth in sultry summer with the oppressive south wind, can you with him spread out the sky strong as a molten mirror? Tell us, Job, what words of man shall we say to be such a being? We cannot state our case because of darkness, that is, our ignorance in the presence of the unsearchable God. So shall it be told him that I wish to speak. Or should a man say that he would be swallowed up and destroyed by God? Now people cannot look at the light when it is bright in the skies without being blinded. When the wind has passed and cleared them, out of the north comes golden splendor, and people can hardly look on it. Around God is awesome splendor and majesty, far too glorious for man's eyes. The Almighty, we cannot find him. He is exalted in power, and he will not do violence to, nor disregard justice and abundant righteousness. Men therefore fear him. He does not regard nor respect any who are wise in heart in their own understanding and conceit. I continued through the end there because it was flowing and uh, to, can, it was making the same point quite eloquently. But uh, what's your response to Well, that was a lot looking at. I wasn't expecting you to go that far. But, um, but all right. Let me pull out my King James and look at it. But looking at kind of what we've seen is it sits here, you know, it talks about like the balancing and about how you ponder like how the clouds are. It seems like it's talking about like, again, it's just a continuation of what you said, kind of trying to humble Job here. It's talking about like how mighty he is and like the ability he, you know, has and asking him, you know, I guess, can you even comprehend like these types of things? And then you know, it goes on to talk about, like, his judgment and, like, his righteousness. So, in a way, it's just a continuation, you know, of this speech trying to, like, humble him in, like, comparison of, like, how, like, mighty God is in comparison to, like, how small Job is. Just like, you know, with any of us, where all of us are small in comparison to God. So, just more of, like, a humbling statement, trying to talk, and again, just ending it with his righteous judgment, again, trying to get him to repent. Okay, so uh, you are a soul winner. Uh, you are an evangelist. And I, I, I'm sure that you must have had this kind of experience, maybe uh, even though, though your, your soul winning time, days are, are less than mine, I imagine you've met people who you've had to make this kind of a speech to them. I know I have. Because they, they're not respecting God. They may not even believe there's a God. Or they, they may be like conceited and they're, they're full of pride and self-righteousness. And, and sometimes 
we need to bring to their attention the greatness of God and how small we are. And we should be humbled before this great God Almighty, the creator, and how tiny. We've talked about this before. The vastness of the universe, the vastness of creation. I mean, we, we you know, we, it's, it's beyond our even comprehension to, to even understand how large the universe is, how long it would take to travel from end to end. And, 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 and yet we reduce it down to this planet. And it's like the planet is less than like just like a particle of dust in the universe and then on the entire planet there's brother Stephen it seems like you're so so tiny why would God even care about you can't you be humble before this great almighty God can't you be humble and grateful that he created you and humble yourself before him that's the, to me the first step in in salvation is is humility to him to stop thinking that way I'm all that good and I, God will be really impressed with me. <laughs> you know, that's the mistake people make thinking that they can go to the the judgment seat, the great white throne judgment. They're going to be there and they'll be boasting before God about how great they are instead of, instead of on their face saying I'm I, I'm undeserving. I'm undeserving. Thank you Jesus for being my savior. And I think this is the kind of speech that, you know, I've made to people to try to humble them. Uh, go ahead, your response to that. Yeah, especially like those thoughts about like how small I am in this universe and just how mighty the Lord is in comparison to me. I think about that type of stuff definitely all the time. I mean, it's been very good for my walk, you know, as a whole, because it just reminds me of, you know, how great the God is, you know, that I've, that I serve and just how merciful he is considering his size and considering my size and considering that I'm so sinful, you know, and don't deserve what I have. It just shows how great he is in just every sense, not just size and magnitude, but also just in love and mercy. And you're right. I am, let's say pretty new to soul winning and I haven't been doing it for long, but I have mentioned it before, you know, when talking. So yeah, well, of course, you know, the one person I think I really explained it to a much, like a lot, turned out they were already saved. But then there's been, you know, other times where it's happened and, you know, they just didn't really hear you. So, I mean, yeah, but it's definitely, you know, effective, you know, when just being reminded, you know, how great God is. And, just how, and it just also reminds you how great a gift salvation is. The fact that he'd just be willing, you know, to offer it to you. You know, when he's just so enormous, you know, mighty, just, holy, pure, and perfect, you know, when I'm small, sinful, and, you know, any other bad adjective you can think of. So it's just, to me, it just shows me just how amazing the gift is of salvation. Well, one of the things that people should notice uh, throughout this entire study of this whole book is that the, the eloquence of the accusers, of course, Job is eloquent in his defense. But really, if you listen to the accusers, the three originals and then Elihu, all of them, are, they, they speak brilliantly. Uh, it's, just, it's, like, it's like listening to some of the orators who are lordship salvationists today. Uh, and some people, I have a, uh, I have a video, I, the title is Lordship Salvation Liars. I think I made it about six or seven years ago. And I'm talk, I mentioned names of some of the famous people who are teaching Lordship Salvation. And, and, and the, the, one of the arguments is not only is their message totally wrong and unbiblical, but their, their um, uh, ability to, to speak and impress people with the volume of their speech, their vocabulary, their delivery, uh, the, at their oratory, some people get won over just because of the beautiful speech. Uh, and uh, they they just accept that, you know, they don't even challenge the content of their, what they're saying because they're just won over by the speech itself. And, and it, it could be very easy for this thing to happen with uh, these accusers of Job because as you listen to their speeches, they're, it's beautifully stated. And what they're saying is really quite true, except... As I've said before, it's, it doesn't apply to Job in his circumstances. The, the problem is, see, now this Elihu in this speech here, in this chapter, um, 
it's certainly appropriate to tell Job that if Job was the guilty party and he was conceited and, and, and uh, you know, disregarding the greatness of God and just full of himself and he's so great and righteous and sinless and, and, and uh, innocent as he claims and that uh, he's not humbling himself to God, that it would be appropriate. But the, but the problem is all the accuser's speeches are based upon the, the premise that Job is a guilty party He's wicked being punished by God, and that's a false premise. So uh, this kind of speech could, is actually appropriate sometimes, but it doesn't apply to Job and his circumstances, and that's where people go wrong in reading Job. They don't realize that even though the, the accusers uh, state their case brilliantly and beautifully, um, and that there's truth in what they're saying. Generally speaking, it's just not true in this particular case because they don't, they never read chapter one and chapter two as we did. They don't know about the original discussion between Satan and the Lord uh, and, and uh, why these things are happening to Job. So, okay, uh, any final comments on this chapter before we close? Yeah, it's just mostly, I think, just talking about just basically how enormous God is and just how mighty it is and just kind of, you know, just being a humbling thing. Like, especially just kind of, it reminds us all to be humble, I think. But of course, even though Elihu was using it wrongly against Job, because Job is innocent. But definitely, you know, when you think about, you know, how mighty, you know, God is, it's definitely a humbling factor. And it definitely shows just how amazing the gift of the gospel is, which we're about to get into. Yeah, uh, I'll let you, Brother Stephen, uh, explain the gospel. First of all, the, the, the gospel, the word gospel is a Greek word, and it means good news. Uh, so we want to tell you good news. And in the, the briefest terms, I would say the good news is that, that Jesus is offering eternal life in heaven to you right now as a free gift. <laughs> I mean, just think about that. Jesus will give you eternal life in heaven as a free gift. He's offering it to you right now. I mean, if you understand that the simplicity of that message and the, the wonder of it, then it, you should be just thrilled if you believe it. But you've got to believe in it in order to receive it. Believe it, then you receive it. Um, but... Brother Stephen will will give you the finer points of this, for, you know how it all works and uh, why uh, why you need to put your faith in Jesus and receive this free gift. All right, Brother Stephen. All right, everybody. Well, if there's anybody you know watching tonight that's you know unsure about their eternity, I want to clear that up for you right now and make you you know secure in Jesus. Well, as usual, I always like to start off by reading my favorite verse, which is sums up the gospel in a nutshell, which is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And this is, in essence, is the gospel, explaining, you know, how Jesus died, was buried, and rose again three days later, you know, for our sins, so that everybody who believes on him will be saved. Now, I'm Let's first talk about the bad news and why this had to happen. All of us, we are sinners. And let's say all of us deserving damnation. And the Bible clears this out. And I have it like, I have three verses for you. As it says in Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the first part of Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. As it clearly says, all of us are sinners and all of us have come short. No matter how many good works we may try to put up or how faithful and obedient we might try to be on our own. And if, if believing in any other thing is not going to work. Let's face it, like no matter how good we are, we don't deserve anything. Like say, we deserve to be punished. As it says, for the wages of sin is death, saying we earned it. We worked for it. But here's the good news now. The second half of it says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
because Jesus paid it all for us. Now to clear up what I was saying about Jesus is the only way, for as he said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man will come to the Father but by me. So we can't re rely on our own works. We can only rely on Jesus. Now Jesus, being God's perfect son, the eternal God, came here to the earth in the flesh in the form of a man. He was perfectly sinless. He fulfilled the law. He was pleasing to his father. He performed many miracles. But then the best part happened. He died on the cross, an excruciatingly painful death, shed his blood, was buried, and then three days later, he rose again. Now, when he did that, he proved who he was. He proved he was the son of God when he rose again. But when he died, he pinned all the sins of the world on him. He took the penalty that we deserve. As it said, the wages of sin was death. Well, he took death onto himself so that way we could have everlasting life. He paid for the gift in full, and he promises that gift to every one of us, and I'm going to tell you how to get it. As it says in John 6:47, this came from the mouth of Jesus. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. The only way to have everlasting life is to believe and trust on Jesus alone. And this isn't just believing that he exists. It's trusting that what he did was enough to save you and nothing else. Let's say don't trust in your own works to save you because on their own, they're not enough. Now, of course, I don't, I'm not saying don't do good works, but I'm saying don't trust in your works to save you. Because it even says that, you know, in Galatians 2.21, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Jesus paid it all. And we can't do it, factor anything else. All we can do is believe and trust on the gift that he gave us because he paid it all. But also, I've got one further point to make. And that is the fact that we have eternal security in him. Once you believe and trust on Jesus... You have everlasting life, and you have it forever. As it says in John 10, 28, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And that's the best part of the, of the gospel. You're saved, not only are you, but you're kept. You're saved forever, and you can never lose your salvation. No one can take it from you. Nothing can take it from you. And it says you will never perish. You will have everlasting life, as Jesus said. He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. And so just in a nutshell, you know, Jesus died, was buried, and he rose again because we are sinners, and he paid the penalty for us in full, and he gives us a gift of eternal life. All we have to do is just believe and trust in him and on his gift, and we'll be saved and saved forever. And that's the invitation I give to everybody out here tonight. You know, believe on the Lord Jesus and be saved, and that's all I have. Okay. All right. Thank you, Brother Stephen. Uh, um, appreciate you uh, joining me tonight. And uh, this picture here of my icon, uh, this is kind of a visual illustration of, of salvation. And that is Jesus reaches out to you and wants to take you to heaven. Uh, he's willing to do it. He doesn't desire that you perish. He, he wants you to come into heaven. And if you'll just trust him, if you'll depend on him instead of trying to get there some other way, just trust him completely, embrace him, and you're guaranteed. He promises you, you're going to heaven. So please put your faith in Jesus now. Uh, now, um, thank you for watching, and I hope you will join us nightly, 7 p.m. Pacific time. Tomorrow is New Year's Eve. Brother Stephen says he's in. So we'll, we'll be here again tomorrow night to uh, celebrate the new year. Um, and I think maybe tomorrow we can kind of recap the year and, and look forward to the next year and discuss, uh, discuss our years and our, and our, uh, our hopes for the next year. Uh, so uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.